Hello and welcome to Frank Fridays. My name is Carlina Muller and you all know my co-host Ellie Hayworth of Hayworth Consultancy. Today we are chatting with Kwong Bao, the owner and director of 1969 Gallery in Tribeca. We're really excited to have him here. So Ellie, I'll let you get this interview started. Amazing. Thank you, Carlina. And hi, Kwong. It's really nice to speak with you today. Hi to you both. Amazing. So Kwong, as I think we were speaking about just before we clicked record, um, you have a really wonderful um, Frank talk that you've written, um, Frank talk interview on Art Frankly. So I think, you know, for anybody who hasn't listened or read it, um, you definitely should take a peek at the Art Frankly website. But I wanted to just kind of unpack some of the things I found particularly interesting from that interview. So maybe you can just start by telling us a little bit about how you approached a career in the arts um, and maybe just a little bit more about what drew you to the professional art world? Sure. Um, my background is mostly in books and magazines. I have an English degree. I went to Columbia for arts management. And then um, I just love ideas. And I thought books were the most democratic format to distribute them. And at some point, I just fell out of love with them because I just felt they were neglected. They weren't edited properly. All my friends were not making careers out of being writers. And I found um, collectors, Susan and Michael Hort, just randomly and started working with them. And that opened me up to the world of visual art. And I became a curator. I moved to Berlin to work in an artist project space. And then when I came back to New York City, I was super underemployed. I just didn't know what to do with all this kind of mixed <laughs> aspects of my resume. And someone said, just do your own thing and we will support you. And somehow that was enough for me to open the gallery in September, 2016. Amazing. Um, and before we move on, I'd love to chat a little bit about 1969, but I'm also very curious, just how do you kind of keep the spirit of your love of writing and your lo love of the kind of written word alive? Is it something that you find incorporates into your, your kind of art practice? Uh, I, first of all, I should say, I don't make any visual art whatsoever. I can't even draw a straight line, uh, but I use language and ideas as um, my response to art that I see. And then the job at the gallery is just to communicate that kind of passion yeah. or interest. So I'm very much interested in the conversation that I have with the visitors, especially in person now with what they see on the walls. And so that interaction and the ways in which language applies, and I'm really intent on saying sincerely, but also very meaningfully words that I think reflect my true feelings about the work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Well, then I think it's a perfect segue to talk a little bit more about 1969. So maybe just tell us a little bit. Um, you've obviously just kind of explained the impetus behind founding the gallery, but maybe just tell us a little bit more about your program, what artists you seek out, and if you have kind of a curatorial mandate. Oh, I wish, I, I think I speak on a lot of, the, of galleries, which is um, you don't have as many choices as you think. A lot That's of things right. line up. The artist has to be ready. The gallery has to be ready. The work has to be ready. The timing has to be there. It's very, very hard to find that kind of alignment, which is what it requires to make an exhibition happen. And right. we're very much a painting focused gallery because I feel like when people travel the, to another city, they go to a museum and they look at paintings. It is one of the most uh, beautiful and long forms of art history mm -hmm. and very approachable. And in that respect, I think I'm always interested, especially right now in kind of figurative representational work. And um, I have to be honest that when I first opened the gallery, I had back my fantasy baseball team. I want to rep her, I didn't want to work with him. And then in a blink, everyone signed everywhere else, big oh. and blue. And I just thought, hey, we, we're all in this together, aren't we? And so my naivete in the beginning, that somehow it was going to be in the kinship of family that we would make a business happen. I, I quickly, quickly, un, you know, kind of unlearned or learned that lesson and uh, tried to focus on the various factors that we now use in terms of determining which artists we might want to work with. I just enumerated some of them, but there's also personal things like, does the team like it? Um, is this mm -hmm. person a great in studio visits? Do we even want to be around them? Do they like us? Yeah. I mean, kind of are the personal factors that matter too? And I guess my favorite thing is to ask artists, which artists are you looking at? And that generates for us a long list as we go around and around and just trying to see, because in a way it's the most important, the hardest respect is to earn from the, you know, from another artist. And yeah. so that's, that's how many of the things that we have done have been informed. I love that. Well, and I think you've kind of hit on one of the key 
for me, one of the key points of the art world is that it is a relationship industry at the end of the day. And so while the art can be exceptionally compelling and very interesting, I mean, when you're working with someone and representing someone, there also needs to be a kind of, um, as you said, a kinship when it comes to actually just kind of your your colleagues and your the artists you work with. So I, I love that. And I think shedding light on that is something people don't often talk about. But also people, maybe artists themselves don't realize how empowered they are. I just remember this vivid moment in which um, I was working with a very young artist who said, my favorite artist is Richard Tuttle. And I said, oh my gosh, we're sitting right here. And he said, oh my gosh, no, I can't talk to him. And then I talked <laughs> to Richard Tuttle and Richard Tuttle said, oh, that's a really good artwork. I said, oh my gosh, this guy on the left, it made that artwork and you're one of his heroes. <laughs> and it took so long for them to cross the room, even though we were seated at a table, Yeah. that I realized that artists can do that. And in a way that maybe collectors need to wind up and maybe curators need a platform or maybe a general audience member has this feeling that it, I can't say anything. I think art artists can cross the room for one another. And it's, it's something very important for people to understand. I love that. Um, Kwong, tell us where did the name 1969 come from? What is it, what does it symbolize for you? Um, that is the year I was born. Okay. In every which way, meaning wise, um, creation is the most creative act. So it has that feel for me. Also, my guy is a mathematician. So it is also, his alphabet is the numbers. The so one, nine, six, nine is me and him together. But also I didn't want to spend the rest of my life spelling gallery Kwong Bao. It just be to hell. <laughs> sure. the world like that. And in a way, America's, one of America's great years was 1969. So much happened from the last time the Beatles played to the moon landing to just all that feel good before, you know, seventies set in. So for me, it's a bit, like a celebration all of it yeah i love it i absolutely love it well maybe you can tell us a little bit about either some of your recent exhibitions or something that you're just particularly jazzed to share today well i always love what's in front of me and sure. i always brag and love what's not sold um just as a way to promote it but the last few shows that we've had with the one that's up on the walls now mark ryan sherriker truly earned, 30, 37 years old, figurative painting, mm -hmm. art historical and, and beautiful. And very proudly, we got things into museums and institutions and um, legacy collections. I, I just don't think when we were cooking this up a year plus ago that we thought we would ever open with that kind of um, support. And before that, we did Caleb Hahn, who has been for me a great lesson in why young artists thrive by moving to New York City. So much has happened to Caleb and so much more. This is going to be his year as he has a, a museum exhibition in, in August and mm -hmm. changing and growing in every way, even his name, even his hair, everything about information. And I just love watching that kind of maturation. I love that. That's amazing. Well, we'll definitely stay tuned on what's forthcoming. Um, and I can speak for art, frankly, when I say that we'll definitely continue to promote um, 1969 and all of its kind of peripheral activities on, on the platform. Oh, that's perfect. You know, it's very ecological, my viewpoint. We all kind of need each other. If you added up yeah. everybody, still quite not enough. And so I'm always encouraging people to look at art, buy art, be a part of it. I think it's wonderful. I love that. Well, Kwong, for us, um, we love to talk a little bit about professional practice. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if maybe as, you know, I, we don't often call ourselves entrepreneurs as, um, you know, business or gallery owners and whatnot, but you are a full-fledged entrepreneur. And so I'm curious, if maybe you can pr um, provide some kind of insights about one thing that you do daily that you feel sustains your business. Ooh. Well, I'm kind of very flattered to be called an entrepreneur. Uh, I think that so many people fall accidentally into the art world that, sure. um, but uh, sure, giving myself credit for the fact that we have two spaces, Lower East Side and Tribeca, and, and each year the benchmarks have been there. But I would say that now that the team has grown and the business has grown, um, I spend a lot of time trying to formulate what exactly my questions are. I know mm -hmm. this sounds abstract, but just to relay from the very beginning, when I opened the business, I was like, okay, how can I get more sales? And as I went around, I realized and asking people, I wasn't getting an answer. And of course at 9 a.m. every day, every corporation, every entity gets up thinking, how can I generate more? So for me, sure. the question was wrong. It wasn't framed right. And I just 
wandered around a lot in my mind until I came up with a question that actually gave me an answer that was productive. How can I get every collector I know to recommend other collectors to the program? Mm. And, I, and that resulted in a little bit of a party that then I met all these people suddenly. And I was like, that's the answer. The answer is actually to try to get the question formulated so that people who love you will help you, right? I wasn't asking for money. I wasn't asking anyone to buy anything. I was asking them for support, advice, mm -hmm. contact, and people do want, um, you know, people we care about to thrive. And so I spend a lot of time in the days thinking, okay, what's the question today? And I don't ask usual questions of myself. And it makes the team a little bit nuts because it sounds like I'm talking a lot to myself. I'm always like trying to come or solve a question like, what are you, what is your, what is your need? And I say, that is exactly <laughs> what I'm trying to do, you know? And it has served <sighs> these questions as I, as I edit and launder them, I really get precise answers that I can do something with. I respect that so much. That is, I'm, I'm taking that piece of advice from this conversation. <laughs> I think that's great. Um, so are there any pitfalls that you've either experienced personally or you've seen in the industry that you'd advise against? Um, it's very easy to be discouraged. Uh, sure. I think organization as it goes from small to midsize has its own danger points. I think we've read a lot about that in the newspapers. Um, I think it's very hard in a small team to maintain the motivation and the mm -hmm. board. And it's so uh, rejection is never fun whether it's from a fair or from an artist or anything. These things are personal in a way too. Not to be meant taken about the person, but that they do impact, for example, the exhibition's calendar. And I just think one has to really hold on and have faith and be patient and knowing that there will be a, no spell backwards is on. And it'll just, and it won't always be there, but we have been getting a lot more yeses than nos. And yeah. I think, just a kind of persistence and, and um, willfulness. And it's much easier to do it with a, with a group because the energy of, of uh, two people working together is vastly different than one person working twice as hard. And, yeah. and that I- Yeah, that is very, that is very fair. Um, Kwan, can you tell us, so obviously you're immersed in the art world um, on the day to day, but how do you feel you stay engaged creatively? You just mentioned, you know, the idea of momentum and and motivation, what kind of keeps you buzzing? Um, I took a watercolor class recently. Okay. Um, just to remind myself how hard it is. They're all horrible. I'm happy to send you the <laughs> to show them. I'm not ashamed of them in the sense that I realize sometimes we talk about things so dismissively as if mm. somehow butter, easy and there, and but it's not. When I sat to make it, I realized this is very, very difficult. <laughs> Yes. So way to kind of like bring back the respect to what I'm um, thinking and looking at. Um, also, I read one business and one self-help book every year. And um, though I'm not a big fan of like the American delusion that somehow we could all improve and get better. Uh, I do mm -hmm. think that there are things on some kind of ongoing basis that I do to just give myself relief. So I run, um, I'm starting to learn how to knit. And then I went back to school to learn about writing and art because I just wanted to sort of make more solid this idea of communicating the ideas and the meanings of, of the artworks, especially at 1969. I love that. Well, as someone who is a, quite a student of communications herself, I, I can respect that very much. Mm -hmm. That's very cool. Um, so maybe we can just conclude with a forward looking question. What is one thing either personally or professionally that you're particularly excited about? now that we're starting hopefully a, a, a new year with a return to some semblance of normalcy. Right. Well, it's not maybe one specific thing as much as I really didn't um, understand until we experienced how important art fairs are. Mm -hmm. They comprise a big chunk of our budget. And with the pandemic, and even if it's safer, people are still more hesitant. Travel is more cumbersome than ever. It can be really discouraging. But for me to try to think about putting a little meat behind the idea that we're working in an international art market by going to a broader, bigger fairs. Uh, Zona Mako is our first kind of fair for mm. this year. And, and just trying to like extend the network so that different people win and that we connect with a broader audience where 
you know, there are differences, regionally speaking, in what art is, um, what art might be hot, you know? Mm -hmm. So in Latin America, it's not the same as it was in Germany. It's certainly not the same where these collectors in Hong Kong and Beijing and Shanghai are building things. It's all very different. And I love difference. And so for me, the art fairs are a way to sort of bring all that disparate part of the art world in a cross-sectional way together yeah. over time. And maybe if, if the world is safer and so forth, we, we really get to meet some of these people we've just been emailing and, and calling yes. in person forever, you know? Yeah. No, I, I share that with you. I'm sorry that I won't be seeing you in Mexico City here soon, but hopefully I'm sure there will be another time that we can uh, we can convene, at, if not at the gallery itself, then at one of the fairs. Absolutely. It's one of the beautiful things of owning a gallery is that people can always find me. And it's where things finish and begin. So I'm very happy to have that kind of space. That is great. Well, Kwong, I have to say this was a delightful conversation and I just appreciate you taking the time today. Thank you. Thank you both.